like this, this technology is powerful. Like you've seen all, all of these people signing petitions against uh, continued development of, of AI. This is a powerful tool. Like what you use it to create is permanently available. It's important that people recognize that. All right, so today I'm really happy to welcome on the show Max Comparetto um, from the Web3 Studio at Salesforce. Welcome, Max. Thanks, Jamie, man. Good to be here. I had the, the privilege of talking to you a couple of weeks back now, and we decided to, to jump on the show and really get you to talk about, yes, of course, what's happening at, at Salesforce. I think it's another validation point for the industry that this technology is interesting and can be applied at, at scale. But then also really to understand your journey as an entrepreneur at Salesforce, uh, you're navigating a large, complex organization, um, but uh, still managing somehow to, to make it, you know, be a, a pretty fast mover in the space. So, so let's describe the, the product a little bit top end and we can break it down. So you have developed and delivered Salesforce first Web3 product, which effectively is an end to end NFT creation and management platform. Um, I was blown away by what you showed me previously. And I know there's a lot more to it than that. But I think the best way the audience can think about it is how do you manage the kind of full life cycle um, of an NFT across departments, across organizations in, uh, in, a, in an enterprise setting. Uh, does it have a name, by the way? Yeah. So, I mean, the blanket reference for it is Salesforce Web3. And then inside of it, there's actually two products. So there's NFT management, uh, which is the no-code smart contract creation capability. Uh, and then there's uh, Web3 Connect, which is like a hybrid, like indexing uh, and data ingestion product. Um, and, and definitely want to get into the weeds on those a little bit more later. Let's start out with you. So, I mean, uh, I think you refer to yourself as a, a co-founder of the Web3 Studio, which is great. A lot of the time we have founders come on the show, um, talk about their startups. But again, there's... Um, there's an increasing amount of innovation that's happening within the enterprise environment. I mean, you, you could argue um, that's maybe where a, a lot of the demand is going to be coming from um, this year in, in 23. And that's really dependent upon small teams, often even just individuals like yourself uh, making things happen. I think you're the only full-time Web3 employee, right, dedicated to the space in Salesforce. That's true. Um, but it was like... It was a small group, obviously, like couldn't, nothing can be done alone in a big company. But like, it was executive sponsorship. It was a small group of people that were super passionate about bringing something innovative to the company. But yeah, like in Workday, technically, I'm like the only one that has Web3 in their title, uh, which is ter terrifying and awesome at the same time. Let's talk a little bit about you. As I understand it, you know, you've been at Salesforce for some time. You kind of worked your way up through there. And kind of in the evenings, you were you were DJing all the way back to I think seventeen. But uh, let's hear it from you. My cousin red pilled me. I was like joking around uh, with some folks yesterday that that should be a T-shirt. But a uh, family member introduced me to crypto in two thousand seventeen, and it was like his means for paying off student loans, which like in the U.S. is like a massive issue, obviously, and probably other places, but here most certainly uh, is the case. I was like paying super close attention at that point. He had like my full attention and I was like, can you help me set up a wallet? So I set up a Binance account. This was when Binance was like international, not US yet. Uh, so they didn't force me over uh, to a new app at the time. Uh, and at that point I moved everything over to MetaMask. In 2018, it was actually the year I started at Salesforce, but also the year that I discovered uh, DeFi. I was looking for something to do with my tokens. I was like, it can't just be that you buy these and they just go up and down and up again and you just like sit there and watch uh, there has to be something more that you can do to leverage these assets um, and i like traditionally have been terrible about uh putting my money to work for me uh so like i was not going to let that happen uh in like this next era of financial instruments and assets um so i um i discovered through his recommendation like compound uh, ave started uh swapping some assets and like putting things in um, like a form that I could leverage them uh, to the greatest 
possible degree. Uh, so I started lending uh, through Compound uh, for yield, lending through Aave. Um, I converted a bunch of my ETH uh, even to CRV because it was like consistently the highest variable interest that I could uh, pull down. After I started like holding Curve and like receiving liquidity tokens, um, like for Aave, I started learning like other things that I could do with those and like borrowing against these things, like collateralized loans um, and like um, yield farming um, governance. Like when I got into the Curve DAO um, and realized it was a DAO and not just a token. Um, and this was just me learning like on the fly. So it wasn't like in any way, some like formal training that I went through. I don't think a lot of people went through any type of formal training, but stumbled along the way. Uh, started participating in governance uh, in the DAO for Curve. Um, learned a lot about finance in general. I think every one of us have uh, in this process. Um, but became fascinated by DeFi. And like, I'm Italian. Like, my grandparents had money in every part of their house. Um, <laughs> I like will vividly remember uh, going to their house and finding money in like coffee cans, like buried in the yard. Um, and uh, it was like a fun activity going around our great grandparents' place and money in random spots. Um, so, like DeFi was fascinating to me—the fact that you could become your own bank uh, and be empowered to like secure your own like financial well-being um, and not necessarily um, you know, hand that over to someone else and allow them to benefit from the liquidity that they would have uh, from that. That was like my entrance into the space. Um, it was also, again, that same year that I started at Salesforce in 2018. So I, uh, I wasn't super vocal initially about like what I had been doing in my free time, uh, you know, with everyone at Salesforce. And when I started at Salesforce, honestly, I started in like the lowest possible level of sales that you could start. I was like selling and Salesforce, like the way it's structured, you, you know, when you're promoted, you're promoted to sell to larger companies. Uh, with like more employees. Um, so I was selling to companies that had anywhere from one solopreneur to 20 total employees. And it was a lot of like tech startups and mom and pop shops, um, crazy stuff. And, um, you know, it was an enterprise tool. We have like versions of our software, but like still nonetheless, like the market perception of Salesforce is that it's an enterprise solution. So spent two years selling those uh, solutions to small businesses and actually six months in, it was a funny story. I like got demoted um, like involuntarily. And like uh, it was, it was because Salesforce originally when I arrived was had a segment where you could sell anywhere from one, uh, you know, uh, to companies with one employee to 50. And then they split that segment in half and anyone that was at the company for six months or less, they put in the one to 20 segment. So like suddenly, and I had been selling to Coca-Cola, Home Depot, WorldPay, Delta Airlines, Chick-fil-A, like major enterprises uh, prior to joining Salesforce and like professional services work. So when I got to Salesforce, I was already like a little bummed, honestly, to be selling like into the small business segment, which later turned out to be a blessing uh, in disguise. But like, then it was, it was jarring. So I, um, I realized that if you're going to sell an enterprise or at least a market perceived enterprise solution to a small business uh, cohort, you have to like take on a lot more responsibility uh, in the sales cycle. So I started like demoing on my own, like not leveraging pre-sales engineers. Um, I got way more technical. I, I like started responding to customer support requests. Uh, and like taking fielding tickets and cases. I got my Salesforce certifications. I started putting my knowledge to work and like volunteering and implementing um, Salesforce for nonprofits because we have a program at Salesforce where you can, uh, any qualifying 501c3 gets 10 free uh, enterprise Salesforce licenses. And it's just a really cool program that Salesforce has. And then we have a job board internally with a list of things that they need help with. Uh, as they're implementing. And so you could go and you could like solidify knowledge that you are developing by grabbing these jobs and like putting your knowledge to the test. And so I started implementing and like taking on odd jobs for uh, nonprofits 
And I like learned a ton. I like started crowdsourcing delivery teams from LinkedIn um, and like from my personal network. I was always a salesperson that was highly and like overly technical and sometimes even criticized for my like affinity for being technical um, and like getting in the weeds. Um, but again, like these are blessings in disguise that you realized later are, are great opportunities. And so um, in 20. 21, I got introduced to a guy named Adam Kaplan, the head of our emerging tech and product group at Salesforce. And um, he's based in Chicago. He's a, um, he's a for- former entrepreneur. He founded a company uh, and sold it to Salesforce, ran Salesforce professional services and consulting for seven years, and then founded Salesforce's first blockchain product, actually, um, which was more of an enterprise blockchain Um strategy wherein customers could leverage Salesforce to build or develop consortiums and like manage governance and invite parties into a permission type of network. Super cool, innovative, a little ahead of its time, potentially it was like 2017, 2018 blockchain craze, but it it just was hard to position to Salesforce customers and like hard to align with our go-to-market strategy because one AE at Salesforce could care less if some other AE's account comes into a consortium with their account. Like it just doesn't work uh, in terms of the incentive model at Salesforce. So um, that product like went to pilot and never left the pilot like phase in in went GA. And so that group kind of broke up, went their different ways within the company, all in like leadership roles and different groups and product teams. And um, in 2020, late 2020, they started having conversations with each other again, came up with a business concept that they were potentially going to consider pursuing outside of Salesforce. And um, we met like several months later as they had developed a concept that they were going to take outside of the company for like an NFT marketplace. And um, they sent me this brief. They got connected to me through like the grapevine inside of Salesforce. Um, And I reviewed it, hopped on a call. Uh, I had like previously had some experience consulting or advising uh, uh, enterprise uh, blockchain um, platform company in the uh, aviation tech space. It was just like sheer luck that I got introduced to this guy, frankly. Like, so this is where it's, I have to be honest, like some of it's sure hard work. And like, I guess it's like preparation meets opportunity or, or luck. Yeah, you got to be ready to, to maximize that. So you said there was this kind of, I guess, like a working group prior, but how much of knowledge sharing that may be seen as non-core to a, a large organization happens in a kind of informal way versus a formal way? You know, were there any kind of, so I know, for example, at the big tech firms like, you know, Google or Facebook, there's there's always been these little telegram groups of employees that are investing together into crypto. And, you know, it's it's never done in a formal sense. Very rarely is it done in a formal sense, but there's these you know, significant like informal networks across these organizations actively degening, you know, talking about ideas that they want to spin out and, and stuff like that. Yeah, so like we definitely have those. Um I would say they're less organized before we acquired Slack. And when we acquired Slack and integrated it, um, those groups like surfaced much like more readily and often. There's definitely those groups and they're like trading groups uh, for crypto uh, that have that butt heads with the trading groups for NFTs. And there's our group, uh, you know, which is like, like a Web3 community group um, that's more like open and general which is like 1900 people uh, in, a, in a Slack channel. Um, and like we created it at the end of 2021 and um, it's grown, you know, considerably. We announced uh, our intention to um, like release this product internally, like to our own employees in uh, February of uh, 21 and, um, or sorry, of, uh, of 22. Um, and, you know, it grew considerably uh, on announcement. Um, and like the other thing that you might not expect, or maybe you will, uh, you've been in the space for a while, you've seen a lot of stuff, but like there's also groups that hate what we're doing. There's like an entire Slack group dedicated to people that like dog on the idea. They just like absolutely hate it. 
and uh, don't love that Salesforce is entering the space. And if you've like seen PR on the early days of our product announcements, like there was even press and like this leaked. Um, so it's like public information, but like, you know, people wrote a letter, like an open letter and a petition to our, our then co-CEOs, uh, Brett Taylor and Mark Benioff, um, appealing to like not pursue this. Um, and like, I think 400 or so people signed this letter. Um, and there's like 700 people in a Slack group that just like love, love to uh, post articles about rugs. I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting. I mean, it's very polarizing. And of course, look, you know, I think we can all be honest and say, look, there are, th- there are aspects of the community that I-, I don't like. I'm embarrassed to be associated to, even indirectly associated. So it's not hard to hate on crypto, right? And crypto culture and crypto bro culture. At the same time, you know, some some of us s- see beyond that, past that, and, and kind of see the potential of technology. And it's interesting because Mark Benioff, I know has been making lots of investments into the space outside of Salesforce, I think through his family office. Um, he's been very, very active um, in, in the space and, and potentially even investing in things that are competing with with what what's being built internally, right? As a diversified approach, I guess. Like in what shape was the concept given to you or was it kind of co-developed? Was it, was it your concept? How, how did the ideation phase work and then how did that get formally tra- transition into a project with budget and, and resource like i said like some some serendipity involved but like the group had like started to come together around this nft marketplace concept and they were thinking about pursuing that outside of salesforce um when i met them um it was presented in like this like 15 or 16 page uh briefing doc and they were going to consult with me um on if they were to leave how could they run a business um like in this space. Um, and I had advised again on like go to market for another blockchain aviation tech company. So it was like something that I had experience with, um, that I could draw on to help with this. And so, um, that was like the context under which I met them. And then the call was obviously like amazing. Um, you know, like I had met people, um, in places in the company that could like move things. And I was in a role where I really like could not do that. I was in a, traditional standard sales role like that I maybe been slightly overqualified for admittedly um, and like felt a little undervalued uh, frankly Um, and the goal was um, then just to advise on that out of that conversation you know came immediately and I mean immediately like we hung up the call I got back on a call like moments later with the architect and like we started riffing on other concepts um, and came up really with something that was entirely different, which was um, not an NFT marketplace. Um, But it was, Hey, before when you guys had developed this blockchain enterprise blockchain, like consortium development and management platform, the idea was that you could deliver that through a Salesforce interface so that it's familiar, easy to adopt, um, you know, like friction reduced, et cetera. Um, can we just kind of reapply that same concept through a different lens or like in a different lane? And um, so the idea was out of those additional conversations, like this was developed and it was no code, smart contract creation with a Salesforce UI UX. And could we string those together even uh, these contracts in a way that like enables or supports business logic being developed? And so really like part of it was, Let's enable um, a no code or and decentralized app development platform with a centralized Salesforce interface, but like enable the creation of decentralized apps through Salesforce. Um, and um, you know what came from that is a smart contract, uh, no code smart contract development uh, platform. And then it was all right. Let's like take this to some outside consulting groups. Um, as a, as a concept, let's get some feedback on, from the market and hear what they think. Um, Mark Benioff was always supportive along the way. He like plugged us into some of these groups um, in his personal network, like his private uh, venture network, et cetera. And, um, and then Mark actually funded uh, some of the development um, and seeded that inside of Salesforce. 
And so it was a wild path and it was a little bit curvy, but. If you're in a company, it doesn't have to be an enterprise to scale of Salesforce, but you have this, you see an opportunity to innovate and it's like, well, do we build it? You know, do we buy it? Do we rent it? Was that a discussion point or was this understanding that not, no, this is the attempt to build it? Maybe somewhere else in the business is a conversation about buying something or integrating something or partnering with, with something. Yeah. I mean, we went through the, the cycle for sure. Um, I would say like the larger question that we spent more time on was, um, you know, should we develop this on a private uh, network or, you know, open this up? And right. um, originally, you know, we had evaluated a bunch of different solutions um, and those ranged from like IBM to VMware. Um, and you know, ultimately the decision was made to open this up and enable Salesforce's ecosystem partners and Salesforce through them and customers uh, to contribute to a growing or budding like public infrastructure strategy. Um, that was much more difficult uh, for sure. It probably would have been way easier to, to develop like if we had gone the other path. Uh, but I, I just felt like this was the right decision. Um, and I just, I think it solves problems in the future pertaining to permissionless partnerships and integrations and, um, open ecosystems that best benefit consumers and all parties involved. And how much did you have to make that argument internally? Uh, was it, did you have a lot of latitude? It was just down to your personal you know, perspective. It, it was the group, right? Still, um, you know, everything that we did, it was like a group decision, but at the same time, like it was definitely challenging, but there was data uh, to support some of these decisions, like in terms of, um, and it's the same type of data that you see now. It's like, hey, look at this e ecosystem growth. Look at the volume of transactions taking place on the network. Look at the volume of unique wallets entering the space. Um, look at developer activity. Um, those other networks sometimes don't really have that, uh, to be honest. Like they, they do, uh, but it's really, it's largely pushed by um, consulting companies and like SI use cases. Um, and their recommendations. So you see like the most most recommended blockchain solutions for enterprise. Um, and you'll see all of these solutions I talked about that are more private or closed. Um, and we had taken that approach before. So we also like had that scar. Right. Um, which honestly helped drive back towards that willingness to open things up. Yeah, super interesting. So maybe let's let's dive into the product itself um you, you gave a kind of high level but maybe we could bring it to life through a, a client case study or, or something like that or, or several yeah um to kind of just showcase how it's being applied the kind of functionality you've got there um obviously you know lots of people will be listening to this i think the technology is applicable not, not just, as you say, in an enterprise context, but that long tail of SME, of course, startups being a subset of that. So potentially lots of prospective uh, clients and partners as well. Like I said, the, the umbrella reference to the tool is Salesforce Web3. And then within it, you have two uh, products. So um, the first product is the one that I kind of just finished referencing, but it's, it's a no-code uh, NFT and smart contract development tool. So you interact with a Salesforce user interface to configure really less customized, but configure a uh, smart contract using a template that we've developed in partnership with uh, consensus actually. Um, and uh, that template, again, interacting with it is as simple as interacting with Salesforce. And so if you've ever used Salesforce CRM for anything like to create any sort of record, if you're a salesperson, and you've created a contact record or a lead record or an opportunity. If you're a marketer and you've created a campaign record uh, to help with like attribution or campaign management, this tool or a service rep and you've created a case record or a ticket, like this tool will look incredibly familiar because it's built and uh, embedded directly into those tools. There's not even a separate app. It's actually just injected directly into our CRM. Um, so you don't even leave the experience that you've been using all, all along. 
Interesting. And to what extent, just even from the language that you use, describing NFTs, I mean, do you obfuscate that? Do you give it a different name like the whole Reddit thing and uh, or Starbucks where you, you – or is it is it still explicit that this is Web3? I mean, I know it's called Web3 Studio, but this is Web3. You're using a blockchain and you're using NFTs, or do you use a different naming convention? Yeah, so this, this is fascinating. I think it surprises people sometimes, but like we don't uh, obfuscate it as much as, as Reddit or those other in, in like D2C, B2C space do. And, and I think it's important, honestly, not to, to some degree. Like, sure, to a degree where, where necessary or, or like va- truly valuable to abstract that, do it. Um, but at the same time for us, like it's important that brands understand what they're touching. Like this, this technology is powerful. Like you've seen all, all of these people signing petitions against uh, continued development of, of AI. This is a powerful tool. Like what you use it to create is permanently available. It's important that people recognize that. Just coming back to that point around haters, you know, so I'm imagining the the Salesforce haters for Web3 are still there, maybe even in growing numbers after last year, right? And and all the all the nonsense that happened. So are they still there? Like what's the narrative? How do you navigate that or do you just ignore it, right? Or do you actively try to educate and educating them is a little challenging. Uh, cause you know, you have to be open, uh, to education and to a, a counter perspective. So I tried that for a while. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, it, a lot of these are people that have worked as engineers, uh, on centralized services, their entire careers. And they've like built their livelihood around their ability to develop and manage centralized systems. And so sure it's kind of terrifying or, or like counterintuitive uh, for them. And I think like empathizing with that is super important um, and approaching that community uh, with open ears um, is also super important because during our development life cycle, they did provide feedback and like ask questions that we hadn't asked ourselves even. I mean, that's positively participating, right? You know, if, if they're giving, yeah. Yeah, 100%. And Salesforce has a, an office of ethical and humane use that guided us through our development journey. Um, and we're along for the ride. We had like weekly, bi-weekly calls with them. We had town halls where we literally just listened to people from the skeptic community, um, like poke holes in what we were doing and ask questions. And that led to... Uh, even like integration of risk mitigation strategies in our product um, and like integrations uh, that we wouldn't might have otherwise like included in our development. I mean, it's, a, it's a powerful feedback loop, right? Cause I mean, effectively uh, uh, our accelerator, that's what we do. We, we, we enable a friendly environment for a network to interrogate solutions. And so in a way you've kind of, you kind of got that at scale in an organization like, like Salesforce, right? And like people were like not unwilling uh, to be super direct and uh, like cutting, you know, you know, developers um, like how they communicate. So uh, (laughs) we got the feedback very bluntly. Um, We incorporated a lot of it into the product uh, and it helps, you know, again, Salesforce can't uh, even like beyond development, like who we can sell this product to. We had mm. to be thoughtful about that. How do you segment that landscape? What industries are you seeing most demand coming from, or at least openness to? Yeah, I would say it, it's fallen clearly in fashion, retail, and consumer goods. Um, I think the terminology in those industries lended itself to their like quick understanding or perception of potential value and opportunity spaces, um, and like from a like supply chain even, or just like business process standpoint, they were kind of pre-aligned um, with drops, with seasonal releases, with community engagement. Like these were things that enabled them to quickly adopt uh, the technology. And so they had a leg up. Uh, so you see like first movers and quick actors, like uh, or early adopters, like uh, Adidas entering the space and hype marketing, uh, drop culture, um, that motion was familiar. Um, then, you know, fast followers, you have, 
uh, industries um, like uh, even like automotive? Yeah, so this in, automotive is an interesting one. So I mean, you, you see these charts all the time. I think Block, Blockworks do some pretty good ones and industries that are adopting. You've got fashion, fashion, gaming, automotive. So like third or fourth. And it's not, it's not obvious why automotive would be interested in this, right? They were like quick movers in 2018 or like even around that time when enterprise blockchain use cases started surfacing. Um, so they had had exposure to leveraging like the underlying infrastructure and technology. Uh, now, like whether it's public or not, that's totally different. But like now at least, you know, there was, there was that. Um, it might not have turned out to be everything that they wanted it to be, but it's been valuable enough to them uh, where a lot of these programs are still alive. Um, and engineering teams are still dedicated to this. <clears throat> so they're kind of positioned well uh, to pursue these types of programs uh, for that. Uh, there's also like, you know, elements of uh, what they do um, that, again, like the, the blockchain aviation tech company that I advise and like work with, um, their uh, permissioned network originally built on Corda, um, where they they invite airline companies, maintenance, repair, and overhaul, or MRO companies, and uh, air, airline parts manufacturers into a permission network and allow them to seamlessly exchange data, purchase orders, uh, RFPs, uh, see who's certified to work on a certain part, have predictive maintenance schedules uh, and automated alerts and notifications and like POs distributed to that network. And like, it's a beautifully harmonious group, like, automotive groups like benefited from similar kind of closed systems, but now they see the potential to also like innovate on their business models and go direct to consumer, not necessarily like cutting out the middleman completely. Uh, Cause that's like been their lifeline for a long time and they don't want to like burn that bridge, but you know, like Tesla having stores really did kind of challenge the business models that, we're incumbent in the automotive industry. So you mentioned Corda. Uh, you also mentioned you collaborate with uh, with Consensus. So how do you compete? Because on the one hand, you're a relatively small team versus these specialist shops who may have hundreds of people just working on this. At the same time, you've got infinitely bigger distribution channel reach, client relationships, and, and, and brand. Right, but how do you how do you see competing as a relatively small part of a big company versus these specialist vendors? Yeah, it's the Mark Benioff approach, man. Um, he's a brilliant, brilliant mind. And like the more you learn and the, the less you pay attention to headlines about him and everything in the, in the media cycle right now, like the more you realize um, and the more you study the history of Salesforce, the more you understand his genius. But like the app exchange from Salesforce is like our app store equivalent to Apple. Okay. Um, there's even like an anecdote that Mark and Steve were super close and that he kind of like seeded the idea of the app, app store to, to Steve um, with the condition that he could create a like platform uh, and marketplace for Salesforce. And um, so, so the app exchange strategy is like Mark's investment strategy through his family office that you talk about. It's like, Hey, we're going to win no matter what. Um, it's kind of like Microsoft investing in open AI. Like, you know, we invest in the tech and everyone uses the tech. We invest in a platform strategy at Salesforce and we invite everyone in and we say build with us. And when they build with us, like there's some benefit to Salesforce, uh, obviously, to having these types of innovative groups in our ecosystem, developing on our platform, integrating with our platform. There was like a... <clears throat> Um, someone who told me a story about a bank uh, that was thinking about leaving Salesforce and like they brought it like it was like some marketing group or some someone in finance who was like trying to <clears throat> like dream big about ripping Salesforce out and replacing it with something and uh, finally took it to like the CTO or the CIO and he was like you're fucking insane there's zero chance that we are doing this you do not understand what you're even like talking about how difficult this will be um like how many things we have integrated into this system and like the implications of this, um, <laughs> you cannot, imagine, you cannot imagine. So like 
while we might compete ev with everyone on one thing, there is no one who competes with us on everything. Yeah, very interesting. And I have read a few books uh, of Mark's, in including, uh, I can't remember which one now, but it-, it, it oh, so yeah, yeah, I think I think that's probably it. Um, well, look, I mean, I, I could you could go on talking to you. I want to be respectful of your time. Um, I know that. Firstly, thanks for being so candid. I think that would be like very refreshing. Um, uh, often, when you speak to people in corporate environments, you get a lot of corporate speak, um, and you don't really get the, get the personal journey uh, behind it so i know the audience would have really appreciated that and i think you know many of them will be sat inside large organizations now either trying to or, or already uh, working on some web3 initiatives and so uh, the idea that there is light at the other side of the tunnel that it is possible despite naysayers despite some of the criticism uh, and your approach to harnessing that, I think, is uh, super powerful. So, um, look, thanks for coming on, Max. Um, really looking forward to uh, seeing what comes out of Salesforce next. Thanks, Jamie, man. It was really good to be here. I appreciate it. <laughs>